Thank you for taking time to go through this webinar, this video blog with me. It's about a topic that I feel fairly strongly about. Each of us is aging at the same pace, but some of us feel as though we've aged a lot faster than perhaps we want to. And it's a webinar that's talking about grief's five paths specifically the five paths experienced by older couples. My name's Leonard McEwen. I'm a registered social worker in the province of Alberta, Canada. And I've done grief and loss work as a part of my career for decades now. I was fortunate enough as a part of my career to be the chairman of the Dealing with Grief Committee for Northern Alberta. And uh, held that role for a number of years. During that time, one of our guest speakers was Dr. Ken Doka, and it was during one of his presentations that he talked about the five paths through grief. And I became interested, and so I obtained a copy of the study and subsequently purchased a book that addressed the study. And uh, those are the findings I'm going to present to you today. So the objectives are straightforward. We want to be able to identify the five paths through grief and take a look at instrumental, intuitive, and uh, children's style of grief, and also probably look at grandparents' grief and recognize the 10 touchstones for finding hope and healing uh, based on Ellen Wolfell. As we do that, we need to remind ourselves of the definitions of bereavement, uh, grief, and mourning. Uh, they're fairly straightforward, and most of us know them, but if we haven't done this work as a part of our normal practice, sometimes they seem to fall out of our memory. So here we go. The Five Paths of Grief, Changing Lives of Older Couples. And this is based on a study by Workman, Bonanno, uh, Ness and Company. Um, I imagine it's about seven or eight years old at this point. <clears throat> and it was called the Clock Study, Changing Lives of Older Citizens. It involved two to 3,000 couples. Uh, one member of each couple had to be over 65, and the, the study was eight years in length. Uh, wonderful piece of work. Uh, Hard to imagine that a study would be funded for eight years, but this one was. So it was a prospective study of marital satisfaction and dealt with things like va values, health, psychological health, social supports, psychiatric symptomology, uh, coping strategies, etc., all of which were tested with various psychometrics throughout the course of the eight years. Um, tested both in health and after illness. So this is important. So as the couples uh, aged and one of them became infirm, the testing continued to find out the impact of health and then subsequently of death on the uh, uh, surviving uh, individual. It's, to my knowledge, the only prospective study that's been done over a, a period like eight years. And as a result of the work that they did, they identified five trajectories through grief. Uh, those were entitled by them common grief, resilient grief, chronic grief, uh, chronic depressed, and depressed improved. And one of the amazing findings f for me was the fact that one of the largest groups had not been studied before, in fact, had fallen off the radar of researchers because people seem to heal themselves. Um, I think that's amazing because it means that we may be pathologizing a number of people that perhaps were doing very well on their own. So here we go. Path one is 11% of the population that they studied um, and they called it common grief, which presented with low levels of depression prior to the death, increase in depression uh, six months after the loss, and they said that accounted for shock. Uh, I found that really fascinating because 
it is consistent with what I experienced in my own life, and that is after the loss of uh, parents in my case, it took me a number of months to come out of that shocky feeling. It attenuated over the next 12 months, so they moved back into a normal state. And this was for many years assumed to be the dominant path that such survivors would go through subsequent to the death of their partners. They showed good coping skills and they had access to memories they had of the individuals and <clears throat> access them in order to help them through difficult times. They were seen to be adaptive grievers. So this is path one, 11% common grief. Path two, this is the surprising one. They called resilient grievers and this is the group that never appeared before. Well, we can see why. They had low levels of depression throughout, and any disruptions that they experienced uh, were of a manageable kind. And they usually occurred immediately after the loss, because by six months, these disruptions were under control and remained that way. Their coping styles demonstrate little avoidance and little yearning for the uh, lost or dead spouse. Path three chronic grief. This is the group the therapists are probably the most familiar with because this is the group that seeks assistance from therapists. There's little depression pre-loss but depression increases to above clinical level six months post-loss. 18 months and beyond they maintain this grief stricken adjustment and there is no spontaneous recovery. The characteristics of this form of grief are high levels of processing of the loss, anguished quest for meaning, counterfactual thinking, and high levels of regret. They regret things because of omission or commission, things that they did or things that they wish they had done uh, as they related to their spouse. They viewed a lot of their relationship as having unfinished business and uh, they often had a prolonged history of dependence and saw the dead partner as being the stabilizing influence on the relationship. Path four, which is 80% of the population they studied, is the chronic depressed group. And it looks like the chronic grief group, if you do not consider the pre-loss period. Uh, pre-loss here shows chronic levels of depression. Uh, the death has only exacerbated the pre-existing condition and uh, post-loss depression does nothing but increases. Now I think it's really important that we recognize that in looking at this group and in fact in providing support and assistance to this group, uh, we have to have really good skills in working with depression as well as great knowledge of grief and loss. The characteristics of the group uh, this group places a, a large number of obstacles and issues in their life uh, out of bounds that you can't work on. They, they spend a lot of time avoiding these issues uh, using all sorts of techniques. They report high levels of hassles and difficulties on an ongoing basis. Low levels of comfort uh, when they contact memories of the person who has died and they report uh, high levels of psychological distress of all kinds. This group requires different kinds of interventions than those with chronic grief. Path five. This is a, a, a path that currently is rated at 10% of of the individuals who they studied, but I expect that this is going to just blossom in the next little while. This is a group that is uh, the depressed improved group. It begins with the highest levels of depression. Uh, post loss, six months after the depression has dropped to normal limits, and it remains that way. Uh, they do fine. They look like resilient gravers. So who are they? 
well, for me, this was my father. My father was a doctor and spent the last uh, few years of his married life as caregiver for my mother. So he experienced all of the stress and distress of seeing his partner um, go through her end of life and is included in this list. These are the battered or, spouses, uh, or abused spouses. That's a major issue in today's society. Caregivers for persons with long-term chronic illness, my mother, for instance, when they experience the loss of their spouse, although they show uh, trauma symptoms, they begin fairly rapidly to enjoy the benefits of widowhood. They're no longer being abused or they're no longer the caregiver. They have little avoidance styles. Right up until the end of his life, my father spoke lovingly of his wife. They demonstrate healthy profiles which persist. This is the depressed improved group. And this brings us to grief experiences. I want to talk briefly about intuitive, instrumental uh, grief, uh, children's grief and grandparents' grief. And I'll start by telling a story. This is several years ago. I was uh, booked to see a couple. They had lost their daughter to cancer and they came into my office and uh, I asked the wife, as I usually do, what brings you in? How can I be of help? And she said, well, we've lost our daughter to cancer and I'm concerned that my husband isn't showing any signs of grief or mourning. And she went on for about half an hour to talk about how she had gathered together friends and family and the community to talk about her daughter and how important she was in their lives. And at the end of this period, when, when she had stopped, I said to the husband, you've heard that your, your wife is concerned about you, that you're not showing signs of grief or mourning. And he said, oh, but I am. And I said, well, that's not apparent to her. Can you tell us how you are? And he said, well, every day I get up and I put on my coveralls and go out and start the tractor. And this is a farming couple. And uh, go to the back 40 and I pick rocks and pull stumps and I plow the field and I'm going to put it to crop. And I sat back for a moment and was bewildered by what he was telling me. And then recognized from my own history. My family is a farming history. And if you go to Dauphin, Manitoba and walk down Main Street and ask some of the folks who live there where the McEwen homestead is, uh, many of them will tell you, well, you go down here two kilometers, then you turn west a kilometer, and then you turn south two kilometers, and there you are. But we haven't lived there for over 70 years. And I gather it's become tradition that if, like my grandparents did, you claim the land and put it to productive use, that it carries the name you give it. And so our area has been called the McEwen Homestead since the beginning of the 1900s. This man was preparing the area to carry the name of his daughter. So why is that important? Well, it's important because it illustrates how important it is that we recognize the uniqueness of how each of us experiences grief and loss. That we must respect how others are coping. Intuitive styles are, used to be called the female style of grief and loss. They tend to be talkers and they look to tend and befriend. They stay connected with people. They wear out supports and they like support groups. 
That sounds like the wife in the case I just gave you. The instrumental grievers, on the other hand, are often male. They immerse themselves in activities often uh, seen as cold or inappropriate, uh, display an absence of crying or reaching out, or they're usually introspective. Anger is uh, usually the expressed emotion, and they are not candidates for group work. I have to tell you that in my career, I have worked in many different sites where I have seen a tendency to split the workforce because there was not an acknowledgement of instrumental and intuitive grief styles of addressing a loss. But the most profound was in a hospital that I worked in, where I had gone to the hospital and worked with them for a couple of weeks after the loss of the child of one of the staff members. And the hospital, because it was in a small community, split amongst intuitive and instrumental grief lines. And after about two weeks, I thought I had done a really fine job and left thinking that things would now work themselves out. I was asked back about six years later, and when I came back on scene for another loss, I discovered that the arguments were still continuing. And so instrumental and intuitive grief need to be arrows in our quiver of tools. When we talk about children's grief, one of the things that fascinates me is the number of people who try and protect their children uh, from knowledge about grief and loss and about death. <clears throat> as a result of that, children don't know what to do because they don't see their parents as models. And in fact, in our death avoidant culture, um, this is, in my opinion, one of our great obstacles. We don't want to experience the pain of loss. And as a result of that, uh, we tend not to have funerals. Uh, funerals are extremely important in what we do to help ourselves heal. And they will be the subject of uh, a future video cast. Um, children often postpone their grief and take care of their parents. Now, that may sound really strange, but you have to look at it from an evolutionary point of view. If children lost their parents, who would provide for them? So uh, it's really important that they look after those uh, upon whom they depend. When we deal with children and grief and loss, of course, we have to deal with age and stage of development. And we have to recognize that a lot of their grief work is done symbolically. Grandparents' grief, this is an area that doesn't receive enough attention. I find it tragic uh, because it affects uh, so many people and will continue to affect so many people as we age. Also, it affects grandparents not only when there's a death, but also when there's the death of a relationship. Their children separate and divorce and they lose access to their grandchildren. So what about grandparents? Well, their instinct is to protect their children and their grandchildren. They don't want them to experience pain. Often the grandparents' feelings are unnoticed because they're so busy in looking after others. And like anyone else, this death often triggers previous deaths and previous traumatic events in their lives. So they're dealing with an overload of grief and loss. They find it hard to understand their child's or their children's, their grandchildren's needs because of the generation changes. Why is this important? 
because couples break up and fight. Children's postpone grief and become surviving parents, intimate partners. They become parentified. And that has a huge impact on the grandparents. I want to talk briefly about death symbols. When we deal with grief and loss, one of my beliefs is that we need to uh, access supports from those around us. But in today's society, we often hide the fact that we're suffering a loss. In days past, we used to use death symbols. Wearing black armbands in British culture was an indication that somebody important in your life had died and you were in a period of mourning. And that death symbol allowed others to recognize that, in fact, was the case and offer support to you. That doesn't happen anymore. And so now we are beginning to see death symbols reappear. Years ago, I went to Alan Wolfelt's Center for Loss and had a conversation with Alan about death symbols. And he, uh, <laughs> he advised me at that time that death symbols wouldn't be acceptable in North American society. I was a bit of a disbeliever, and so I came back, and uh, when I was home, I created a hundred death symbols, a hundred black ribbons, and uh, let people know I had them, created a card that went with them that talked about their loss, and within a day, they were gone. Now, since that time, I've given away 22,000 of them so that people can display to others their loss and how helpful it would be if others would support them. As well, I know those pins have gone around the world to Japan after the tsunami to South Africa, Ireland, Britain, France. And so I think that a black ribbon or something of that nature that allows us to express our loss and the fact that we're compromised is still an important uh, symbol in our society. So when we look to understanding our grief, I go back to the work of Ellen Wolfelt because I think it makes sense. There are 10 touchstones to hope and healing in his work. And the first one is be open to the presence of your loss. Acknowledge the reality of your loss. Go to the funeral. It begins the process of healing. Because I think, as Alan does, that recovery is a lifestyle choice. Dispel the misconceptions about grief and loss. Uh, some of those misconceptions are grief and loss, uh, or grief and mourning, rather, are the same thing. They're not. One is internal, what we do for ourselves, and one is external, what we do socially. Grief and loss, or grief and mourning rather, continue in a predictable and orderly fashion. Not true. I've done this work for a number of decades now, and if there is an orderly passion, I, or pattern rather, I have yet to, uh, to see it. You should move away from grief, not toward it. In my experience, if you move away from grief, three or four or five years later, it will come back and visit you again. Tears are a sign of weakness. Uh, in my opinion, they're a sign of strength. Being upset and mourning uh, meant the break with your faith. Not true. I have met lots of people who are angry at God as a result. You only grieve and mourn for the physical person? Not true. 
you look at all of the secondary and tertiary losses that we experience when we lose somebody that we care about. Loss of self, loss of security, loss of meaning, loss of the person who drives the camper when you go on holidays, loss of the person who balanced the checkbook, and so on. Don't think of the person who died on special occasions. I always take great comfort in the fact that my family lights candles in memory of the people that we've lost. And on special days, we'll make place settings at the table so that their memory is discussed openly. Your goal should uh, be to get over grief as soon as possible. As I age, it becomes more and more apparent to me that we never get over grief and loss. I still grieve for the parents that I have had that died, for the friends that I have had that have died. I don't think I'll ever get over them, nor do I want to. Grief bursts, those moments when something triggers a memory and you suddenly feel sad, uh, used to be something that I dreaded. Today, a grief burst gives me an opportunity to revisit positive memories of the person who has died. And I think it's vitally important that I continue those memories throughout my life. Nobody can help you with your grief. That's not true. Mourning is a social undertaking. And in fact, our research is showing us that those people who help us heal themselves faster than those like us who would receive their support. Grief and loss has many facets and many myths and misconceptions. I think that a conversation with them, or about them rather, is vitally important with any person who is experiencing the loss of anyone. So we have to embrace the uniqueness of your grief. Grief is a creation of your unique self. It involves the breaking of bonds of attachment between you and the person who has died. And they are your bonds of attachment. They are not somebody else's bonds of attachment. And they carry with them all the facets of relationship that you had with that special person. Explore your feelings of loss because you're gonna feel a broad range of feelings and they're gonna fluctuate. You're going to go up and down and up and down. And there are many techniques that we use to explore those feelings from journaling to creative arts, etc. Recognize that you're not crazy. And that perhaps is the most common expression that comes into my office when I deal with a person who is experiencing grief and loss. They'll come in and say, I'm experiencing all sorts of things. And I think I'm going crazy. And what they will have done is given me the common normal symptoms associated with experiencing acute grief and loss. Grief bursts. I talked about them earlier. Let me tell you a story. When I was a child, my mother would come up behind me if I was having a bad day and wrap her arms around me and rock me and sing Mirzy Dotes and Dozy Dotes. And I listened to the music of the 40s and 50s on the radio. And often that tune is a part of the playlist. And when, it, when they play it, I instantly am taken back to my feelings of loss regarding my mother. Now I think I'm a bit past the crying and sobbing, but I do feel that huge feeling of sadness. I remember the linking objects, those objects that remind me of her. The one in particular was a 
a uh, measuring spoon for nabob coffee was brass. I never had suicidal thoughts, nor did I make use of drugs and alcohol, but those are common occurrences in um, some populations. Mystical experiences, however, I did have. I did believe that I heard her one night, and it was a wonderful experience. So as we understand the six needs of mourning, accepting the reality of the death, letting yourself feel the pain of the loss, remembering the person who has died, developing a new self-identity, an identity without that person in your life, a search for meaning, and the fact that we must let others help us. Those are part of the work of uh, Alan Wolfelton. If they speak to you, I would encourage you to read his material. Remember to look after yourself, physically, emotionally, cognitively, socially, and spiritually. One of the first things I encourage people to do is resume their physical program. An exercise program will help them more than anything else. Drinking water is vitally important. I encourage people to take cod liver oil because many of our uh, researches uh, have determined that cod liver oil can be as effective, if not more effective, than antidepressants unless you're so depressed that you should be hospitalized. Reach out for help, not just once or twice, but anytime you need it. Make sure you learn what is effective help for you and let others know what they Seek reconciliation, not resolution. This isn't going to go away, nor do I want it to go away in my own life. I want those memories of my mother, my father, and my friends. Appreciate your transformation. Sometimes it takes many years for you to appreciate <clears throat> what growth you've experienced as a result of suffering the loss, but there will be growth. Listen to others just as you would hope that they would listen to you. That's perhaps the most effective way you can be of help. And as we've gone through this, I hope you've recognized that this is a dramatic change from Kubler-Ross. Some things that concern me are physicians um, are not the person that we should consult when we've experienced a loss because they won't know many of these findings. And they don't have time to deal with us in a manner that is helpful to us. Please recognize uh, that medication, antidepressants, postpone grief. And so that's not where you should go. Grief is a natural experience and supports need, the specific needs of the bereaved individual. It's a social, social experience. 65% of grieving persons report that they experience the presence or report seeing their dead loved one. 65%. That means those who do not experience that. Well, I won't go farther. The majority of our grieving is done while we are driving. This has huge impact on us. Many years ago, I was asked to attend an office in northern Alberta. And when I got there and found out that I was working with a group who had lost a, a member of the staff, uh, I went into the group and uh, they began to tell his story about how he was head of safety and an important person in the life of that company. And I knew from my own experience that safety people are generally anal about safety. 
And so it really surprised me that they would be telling me that their safety man had died. I thought, well, it must be misadventure as opposed to some form of omission or commission on his part. And as the conversation continued, it became apparent that he was coming back from the funeral of his mother-in-law and that he went through a stop sign and was hit by a truck and killed. So why is that important? Well, the important thing is that we're doing most of our grief work when we drive. And it wasn't that long ago that I attended a meeting where I got some very bad news about a project that I had been working on for a number of years. And I left the meeting and I got in my truck and within two blocks I'd driven through a red light. So I'm going to suggest that grief and loss, when we work on it, when we do our grief work, is when we drive. And so if you happen to be a person who is driving or operating the equipment, please, please be careful if you're doing grief and loss work at the same time. Pull over, allow the grief to pass, and then get back on the road. If you have any questions about what I've said, or about the material I've presented, or if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint slides, please give me an email or a call. My email address is McEwen at Highlander-Counseling.com and I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Thank you.